Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Urban at the Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum in Hyde Park, New York. And we're here to offer you another one of our At Home with the Roosevelt's part of our ongoing series. And, you know, one of the great things about this job is that I get to meet uh, very interesting people from all over the world and um, hear about very interesting topics um, that folks have, uh, have been studying. And um, <clears throat> that is going to happen again today. Today we're going to hear from uh, George English, who is a genealogist and historian, and he's director of the Research Through People group. And he has done some fantastic research on the Delano side of the uh, the Roosevelt clan. And um, we're going to learn so much important and infor uh, interesting information today. We're going to get right to it. So let me introduce George English. George, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, tell us about the, uh, the Roosevelts um, and the uh, Delanos. Great. Well, well, thanks very much, Jeff, and uh, thanks very much for inviting me. And I'd like to thank yourself and Cliff Lobby and Paul Sparrow for setting this up. Um, so we're talking about FDR Roosevelt's ancestors, but Pat, these are the ancestors of every single descendant of Francis Cook and Philip Delano, you know, more than a million people. So hopefully <laughs> there's a few people who are interested. And what's particularly fascinating about this is they lived in four different countries in less than 50 years during the Reformation. And we talk about that. And their lives were affected by the same things as the English pilgrims, but also in some cases in very different ways. And that would have affected their character. And we don't physically know what they were like, but the words like tough, rugged, and intrepid come to mind. So next, we now go to the slide presentation. And let's look at Europe in the 16th century. So here we are. England and Scotland were the same countries, but there was no United Kingdom then. France was a country, but the border wasn't quite the same. There was no Germany then, there was just a German empire. What we now know of as Belgium and Holland weren't countries, they were 17 provinces, the Low Countries or Netherlands, in fact, the Spanish Netherlands, because they were ruled by Spain or Habsburg Spain as it was. Now, the most powerful country then for religion was Italy. <clears throat> because Europe was not just Catholic, it was Roman Catholic, headed up by the Pope down in Rome. The most powerful country was Spain. <clears throat> I already mentioned that they ruled the Netherlands and other territories. During the century, they brought back wealth from South America and were a very powerful country. Um, <clears throat> now, two big events happened more than 100 years before the Mayflower and Fortune sailed. The first one was in 1492, when Christopher Columbus discovered the new world. Um, and what I like the thing when they say, when he went, he didn't know where he was going. When he got there, he didn't know where he was. And when he came back, he didn't know where he'd been. <laughs> so they just called it the new world. But that, if you like, would be the pull that would eventually attract the pilgrims to go over to, to that side. Um, now, the ruler of Spain then was Charles V, one of the most powerful monarchs in history, ruler for most of the first half of the century, in England, we had a similar situation. Henry VIII was the monarch for almost 40 years. Um, and now the second big event that happened was in 1517, Martin Luther nailed up 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, protesting about some of the Catholic practices. And his ideas spread. Even more powerful than him was John Calvin, who was based down in, in Geneva, and their ideas spread. And some European countries went Protestant, some stayed Catholic. Now, if you were a Protestant in a Catholic country or a Catholic in a Protestant country, you would almost certainly be persecuted. And under the Spanish, the Netherlands, they reckon the Spanish killed 50 to 100,000 people. Now, the Delanois and Mahiers lived in the Netherlands. They lived in Flanders. <clears throat> and here we have a, a brief thing. You can see the symbol for Delanois and uh, Mahier. Roosevelt. Obviously, it's a Dutch name. Basically, in the Netherlands, the southern provinces spoke French. The northern ones spoke Dutch or Flemish. So Roosevelt is certainly a name. And so that's what we're going to do, focus bit on where they lived in Flanders. We're going to focus on England and what happened with the pilgrims. And we talk a bit about Spain and so forth in terms of focusing on what happened in the Reformation. <clears throat> now, um, what did happen? Well, Henry, eventually in 1534, he took England and left the Catholic Church, left the road. <clears throat> now, interestingly enough, what happened in Flanders and under the Spanish in 1535, um, Charles 
executed an edict condemning the heretics to death. There were basically five phases in the comparison between the Delanois and Mahieus and the English pilgrims. Up to 1534, 1535, when they were both living in Catholic countries, what happened for the next 50 or so years was very different in Flanders under persecution by the Spanish. Um, and then we'll talk later about them actually fleeing and coming across to England, living in the same country as the English pilgrims before they went to Leiden. Now, with the Spanish persecution, of course, a lot of people fled. A lot of the refugees came across to England and Henry VIII allowed them to stay. <clears throat> um, now, uh, he allowed them to stay. Let, let's look at England in a bit more detail then. So Henry was the King of England for um, the first half of the 16th century. Next. <clears throat> and then in the second half, we have Philip II taken over from Charles V in Spain. King for almost the sec <clears throat> most of the rest of the century. And Elizabeth is queen. Briefly, there was Edward and then Mary in Elizabeth. Mary took England to be Catholic again. But then Elizabeth became queen for the rest of the century. Um, <clears throat> And so, as we know, or I'm sure most of you know, what happened is Elizabeth tried to steer a middle path for uh, Protestantism, and that didn't suit everyone. So, in fact, the core of the people who went across the line and the Mediterranean were two communities, two, two congregations in the middle of England. They became known as Separatists because they had the idea to grew to separate from the Church of England, <clears throat> and they would eventually go to Leiden. Now, there's Leiden in Holland. You can see that where places are relatively. As you know, the pilgrims spent about a dozen years in Leiden before they decided, let's go across to New England. <clears throat> and of course, the reason we're talking about this particularly now is 1620. Last year, 2020, was the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower. Uh, and of course, this year will be the 400th anniversary of the Fortune, which is what Philip was on. <clears throat> Next. <clears throat> and a little bit of technology here. Let's see if we can get the Mayflower sailing across to New England. As people said, it doesn't sail across land, but I'm sorry, PowerPoint's good, but it can't do that as such. So next slide. So here's for England. So here's Henry VIII. So he's become king in 1509. Now I like twists in stories. He is married to Catherine of Aragon, who is the aunt of Charles V of Spain. So when she didn't give him any sons and he wanted to divorce her, that upset the Pope in Rome and also upset Charles as well. But in due course, he issued the Act of Supremacy in 1534 and split from Rome. <clears throat> and I mentioned these refugees coming across from the Netherlands. He allowed them to settle in England. <clears throat> now, he is followed by his son, Edward VI. But of course, Edward VI was very young when he became king. He was only nine years old. Protestantism spread much further throughout England, much more strongly. And these refugees coming across, they spoke Dutch or French. <clears throat> so they had no service in their own language. So in 1550, they set up the first churches with languages, with services in their own language in London at first. <clears throat> Abraham, unfortunately, only lived to age 15, and he's succeeded by Mary. <clears throat> now, she's known as Bloody Mary because she's of England to be Catholic again, a lot of bloodshed. Now, another twist. She marries Philip II of Spain. Um, and so, if you like, the King of Spain became the King of England for a while. Um, but unfortunately, she died soon after. So she's followed by Elizabeth. And we'll have a look at what um, she did in the next slide. So I mentioned already, she took England to be Protestant again, tried to steer a middle way, as I say, it didn't suit everyone. Now, another interesting connection with Spain. 1588, Philip II sends the Spanish Armada. And if that had succeeded, the King of Spain would have become King of England again. But it's ironic because it wasn't the King of Spain who became King of England. It was the King of Scotland. And so when Elizabeth died, James VI of Scotland became James I of England. He banned private religious meetings, which is almost certainly one of the catalysts for the separatists to go across to Leiden. Let's look at the separatists in a bit more detail. Um, the ones who went to Leiden were in the middle of England. There were others in other places. It wasn't just their ideas. But from about the 1580s, these ideas grew about we're not comfortable with the Church of England, about separating. And in 1606, they actually separated from the Church of England and they went across to Holland in 1608. Um, <clears throat> so thank you. Yes, next slide. So let's look at the Delanois and Mahieus. And what we've got here is a family tree, if you like. So there's Philippe de Lanois, as his name was when he got on the fortune, changed fairly soon after to Philip Delano. 
and John Cook went across on the Mayflower with his father, Francis Cook, and his mother, Hester Mahieu, was the sister of Philip Delano's uh, mother, Marie. And so we got here going back in time. Now, this is fascinating for a number of reasons. They actually lived in four different countries, let's say in less than 50 years after they left Flanders. I don't know of any other Mayflower or uh, Fortune passenger who did that. Now, they're non-English. Now, about 95% of the pilgrims, as you know, were English. So one of the very few non-English pilgrims. And what's fascinating is already hinted, their story was similar in some ways, but contrasted in other big ways to the English. Now, you look at this family tree, if I don't know, very spectacular. There's their Philip and John and their parents and grandparents. Very few pilgrim passengers know who their grandparents were and know where they came from. We actually know where the people came from. I'm going to talk about that more in a moment. Now, in the Delano, the Delano Kindred, in 1899, two Delano brothers wrote this incredible book, The Delano Geniality, two parts. Part two was from 1621 on, after they got to America, and part one was before 1621, that there's time in, in, Europe, in Europe. Now, some good things about that, some less good things, and we'll come back to that. But let's come back to our map and look at the de Lanois and Mahieus in a bit more detail. So there they are living in Flanders in the 16th century. So briefly, Flanders is one of the 17 provinces of the Netherlands. The northern part spoke Flemish, Dutch. The southern part where the de Lanois and Mahieus lived spoke French. And very much Flanders was known for the textile skills. Here's a tapestry actually from Lanois in Flanders that I brought back. Um, so th they're there. The uh, Reformation is starting to happen, and in 1535, Philip V issues an edict condemning all heretics to death, all Protestants and Calvinists and so on. So in England, they've gone Protestant. Very different story in Flanders for the de Lanois and Mahieus. <clears throat> so, uh, next slide, can we? <laughs> And what happened is they went across from Flanders to Canterbury. And the interesting thing is they didn't go to Leiden, Holland. They came across to England. So they're living in England for about a dozen years, we find, while the shepherds are there. So they're, they're foreigners, if you like, in England, but they're experiencing some of the same things. And eventually they leave there and they go across to Leiden. And they go to Leiden in 1591. They're there for almost 20 years before the English pilgrims. So they're experiencing Leiden. Then the shepherds come across. I'm sure they've been delighted to meet people who not only spoke English, but had lived in their country for that length of time. OK, uh, next, please. So let's look a bit more detail. We're zooming in on that map. You may have noticed that uh, where the Lanois Mahes lived was just north of fr France. So you can see that's where the French border was at that time in the south. I've put a green square around where the um, de Lanois and Mahieus. The de Lanois lived in Tourcoing. You can see Lille there. Lille is a big city around that place. The Mahieus lived in Lille and also in one of the other places. And you can see the town of Lanois there, just about five miles from Tourcoing. Almost certainly, and I'll tell you more, that's where the name came from. Almost certainly we know that the de Lanois lived in Lanois probably in the 14th century or before and then left. And we'll talk a bit more about how the way surnames are created. So there's French speaking Flanders. See some of the other provinces there, Haino and Brabant. I'll say a bit more about Brabant in a moment because when the Spanish got going, they really went <laughs> through this. And you can see that the languages spoke. So Walloon is basically a dialect of French, but north of this map, they speak English. Now, there's a lot of confusion we know for over a hundred years. The, there are the de Lanois Mahias living in Flanders. You can see where France is, and the Huguenot, the Protestants in France were called Huguenots. And there's been confusion. The de Lanois Mahias were not from France. They were not French. They were not Huguenots. And Walloons, Wallonia. Wallonia actually was, um, the Romans gave the name Wallonia in the first place. Uh, and the Walloons are the natives of Wallonia. And you can see where Wallonia is. It's roughly speaking going from Mons to the east. It comes a bit of Haino you know, and other provinces of the south. So please, the de Lanois and Mahieus were not French, they were not Huguenots, and they were not Walloons. Now, later on, blanket terms are used, but it's very important we know this because we want to home in on what actually happened in their lives. So we're now going to zoom in 
closer to Torqua and Leo, where they, they lived. But just before doing that, I can't blame people from, not from Europe struggling with understanding geography, particularly the 16th century. Us Europeans struggle to understand where places are in America. What often happens is to have an analogy, a comparison with something you know. So imagine that Flanders is like USA, that France is like Mexico, and Wallonia is like Canada. Now, even recently, I read articles that said that the Delanois were both French and Walloon, or Huguenots and Walloon. It'd be like saying people from USA were both Canadians and Mexicans. So I hope that helps to clarify this and we can <laughs> avoid any such problems in, in the future. So zooming in a bit more on where there's Lyon, you can see in Torquette. Now, the Mahiers we know moved around. They actually lived in four places that we know. They lived in Lille and they lived in these places just north of Lyon, Armentier, Hublin and, and Ondieu. Almost certainly worked in textiles and that the father would have moved around. I mean, we don't know, but what you can do is have a, an informed guess at some time. Just to sort of clarify here, <laughs> how on earth is Lille in France now? Well, 100 years later, 1668, it was captured, and so French France became part of France, and Belgium did not become a country until 1830, and you can see there where the border between Belgium and France is now, but it was not in the 16th century, which is what we're interested at. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so let's go and look. Now, the Delanois lived in this place, Torquin, in Flanders. Here is a painting done in 1603 of Torquin. Those of you who descend from Philip Delano, this is where your ancestors lived in the 16th century. Can you imagine it? Now, imagine it. Unfortunately, most of those houses are no longer there. The thing that is there is the Church of St. Christopher. And Torquay became famous for war. You can see the population went up by five times in just 70 years, between 1490 and 1566. Delanois is the ninth most common surname, very common surname. And the obvious reason is, of course, a number of people moved from Landois and adopted that as a surname. Now, what happened in Flanders while they were living there. Um, we've discovered now that actually they live not, we didn't just know that they lived in Torquay, they lived in the district of Verdica, which is on the west side. We, the painting is actually done from the northwest of Torquay, looking south. Now, Verdica was on the west, uh, and roughly there, it's just over half a mile from the center. Now, so we actually know the district in Torquay where the, um, the landmarks lived. Name Verdica, French for green is Vert is tail, so literally it means green tail, uh, but they, they lived there. Um, now, another intriguing thing, we're talking about Roosevelt. They have a street in Torquay called the Rue Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and we're going to say, there we go. Um, do you see anything missing there? It doesn't have Delano in the connection with Torquay, because they didn't know that he came, his ancestors came to Torquay until I told them. <laughs> So I did an article a few years ago for the local journal there, and, and I called it President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a child of Torquay. So we, we've helped them. Now, interestingly enough, I've suggested they put Delano in the name. Reaction was always a bit long, but maybe if some people from the Roosevelt Institute or the visit there, maybe they would change that. Now, um, as the Reformation spread, 1556, so middle of the 16th century, there was an article about 25% of people who were infected with this Calvinist heresy. So it's starting to gain control. Uh, so let's move on. And let's look at Torquan now. You can go and stand in your ancestors' footsteps. So this is a modern photo looking exactly the same direction as that painting. All of the houses are gone, but the Grand Place is there, and there's St. Christopher's Church. You can go into St. Christopher's. You can see where the Delanois worshipped. You can see where John Delanois was baptized. And a remarkable story. You can go up to the first floor and see where the baptism register and other registers were hidden in 1578 and not found for more than 300 years. So what was it like under the Spanish? Well, Charles V, eventually Philip II becomes king. 1566 is what they call the year of the iconoclasts. Icon, the church icons and so on. People went to church after Catholic church. 
destroyed the icons, particularly some of the, the paintings and things that annoyed them. And in 1566, someone was talking to the ruler in, in Spain and said, Madam, why are you afraid of these beggars? Now, the French for beggar is ge. And so sometimes the Protestant, the Calvinists are referred to as ge. Uh, so let's look at this in a bit more detail. <clears throat> And this is the most graphic painting I've come across to demonstrate what life was like under the Spanish. This is The Master of the Innocents by Peter Bruegel the Elder. And just look here, and you can read at the bottom there. Here's a Flemish village, a group of Spanish soldiers attacking it. You can see Stoke soldiers stabbing babies while the other mounted ones would look on. Others guide women into a house, break into an inn. It's sort of painting you can look at for quite a while. But imagine living in a village or town in those days, fearing that the Spanish will come and do that sort of thing to you. OK, so let's look in more detail what happened under the Spanish. And the governor of the Netherlands, 567, was Alba, the Duke of Alba. He set up the Council of Troubles, which became known as the Council of Blood because of the number of people who were executed by it. And in 1578, the Duke of Parma took over and he negotiated the Treaty of Arras. Now, in this, Lille and the places around it gained autonomy. The Spanish would not go in there, but the Catholic religion was imposed and the Calvinist leaders were banished. And that was a key factor for the Delanois, because let's look at what happened to the Delanois. They're, they're, um, they actually left around 1579 because of this. Palmer continued and he reconquered the rest of Flanders and Brabant. You saw earlier on where these were, but he swept through the rest, which meant there was a big outflow of refugees. The, the landlords were no longer around, but they were in England where a lot of these refugees came to. Um, so in Torquay, the year of the iconoclast, St. Christopher was one of the churches sacked by them, and there was a, an incident where 1,500 Protestants were killed. 1570, the cure was assassinated. And in 1578, troops broke into the church of St. Christopher. Now, this was very significant because, long, long story, but the, uh, the church registers were hidden then and were not found till more than 300 years later. I'll say a bit more about it in a moment. But basically, we're pretty sure the Treaty of Arras would have been the catalyst for the Delanois and Mahios to leave. We don't know the exact date, but we know they were there, etc. And... What do they get? Where are they going to go? Now, let's go to somewhere that speaks French. I'm just going down to France. But the Huguenots there, there'd been a massacre just a few years earlier. Why don't we go to Ho Leiden, Holland? Well, Leiden is also still ruled by the Spanish and there are no French churches. So they decided to come across to England, to Canterbury, where there was a French speaking church. Now, I mentioned earlier on that uh, England started setting up strangers churches for these refugees. So the first one was in London. And then they spread throughout the, the southeast. Um, next. And you can see various churches there. Now, I've highlighted in bold one or two things. You can see blue is the churches that were sort of French or Walloon. Orange are the ones for Flemish or Dutch. So Norwich. Norwich is different for two particular reasons. John Robinson, who took the um, separatists across to Hyden. He was based in Norwich in 1603 when James became king. And there were both Dutch and French refugees there. He was certainly met the Dutch ones. Um, that certainly could be one reason why a vengeance decision was made to go across there. Um, <clears throat> Canterbury, I'm going to say a bit more about in a moment. 1575 was when that was set up. Now you see Sandwich 1560. In fact, what happened, people in Canterbury went to Sandwich and encouraged refugees to go there. Now, textile is very important behind this, the skills these people from Flanders had. So they weren't just refugees, you know, no hopers. They brought particular skills which were attractive. Um, the Delanois and Mahios arrive in 1579. You can click next one. Um, not sure exactly when. Now, so Jean Delanois and Marie Mahieu, Philippe, Philippe Delanois's parents, would almost certainly have met over there. Now, let's look at more detail at Canterbury. There's a magnificent Canterbury Cathedral. The refugees have brought their textile schools from Cambridge. And where were they going to worship? They were given the crypt, the basement of this magnificent Canterbury Cathedral for their church. While they were there, I mentioned uh, the Spanish Armada. Now, you think that the Landos Mahios have fled from the Spanish. They're in England when the Spanish Armada comes. And in fact, the Duke of Parma 
had an army of 30,000 people waiting to come. If that had succeeded, they wouldn't have got away from the Spanish, but as we know that they did. Um, and just to finish off the slide, by 1590, when the Delanoas Mahias left, over 3,000 3, refugees out of a population of 9,000. But 1591, they go to Leiden because two big things have changed in Leiden. Leiden has become much more peaceful because the Dutch Republic was declared in 1581 and they've set up a French church. So they go across there. Next. Right. Let's do a bit of walking in our ancestors' footsteps. So you can go across to Canterbury, you can see the magnificent cathedral. Let's go and have a look at where that the Lanois and Mahios actually worshipped. You can go around the side, there's a sign about the French Protestant church in Canterbury, the Glees is church, and then we can go inside. Next. And here is where your ancestors worshipped. Now, what's amazing, services are still held to this day, much smaller number, but there's still a French Protestant church which meets every week, and you can go there, you can actually stand where your ancestors actually worshipped. But in due course, they left and went across to, to Holland. So next. I'm sorry, I'm jumping on time. <clears throat> so here's a map of uh, Canterbury at the time. Circle there. You see it's on the northeast side. There's Canterbury Cathedral. Palace Street. They reckon most of the early refugees lived around Palace Street. What was life like for them? Well, in fact, it, these churches were pretty well organized. They maintained orphans and widows. You can read the thing here. They paid the minister's wages and rent for the crypts. They did pay Canterbury Cathedral. The elders visited the flock, collected money, doing all sorts of other good things. And next, if someone wanted, had to go back to the Netherlands, got money for that. Now, the most frequent misdemeanor was drunkenness. Now, I researched the court records over there to see if I could find anything about the Lanois and Mahios. Not a thing. So anyway, they eventually leave and go across to Leiden. And here's a painting of Leiden at the time. Now, Leiden had some nasty sieges by the Spanish, 1573, 1574. Um, but 1581, the provinces we now know of as, as Holland declared independence, the Dutch Republic. And gradually it became more peaceful. Um, the first Walloon church, the Bruckerk, was set up in 1584. And of course, they had services in French. And the Delanois arrived in 1591. And that's the sort of phase before the pilgrims arrived from England. But the settlers arrive in 1609, so the, the land was a Mahio has been there almost 20 years. And the settlers went to worship in the Verkak as well. They'd have met, of course, and I'm sure the pilgrims from England were delighted to meet the land was a Mahio who spoke English and had lived in England. There. And in due course, sure enough, 1620, the saints left on the speed bump. So there's our family tree. So you now got a feel for who was who, where they lived, and so on. Um, <clears throat> Marie Mahia, her, her husband died. Sean died. She remarried. I mentioned the Cooks. I mean, so you where Norwich was. The Cooks went across to Norwich just after John Robinson left. Were there for a couple of years, but they came back to Leiden to baptize John Cook, who was born in 1607. And in due course, Francis and John left on the Speedwell, 1620, and then the Mayflower. Philippe went on the Fortune in 1621, and Hester followed on with three of the, the other children. On, in 1623. And there are five US presidents descended from the Delanois and Mahios, and also Winston Churchill, the um, Prime Minister in England during the Second World War. So how can you find out more? Well, I've been researching this for many years. This year, I've published two articles in the leading Mayflower um, journal, the Mayflower Descendant, um, further findings, and I've reviewed 45 publications since 1899. Many in America, but I found 17 that were published in Europe. Quite of them I found information known in Europe that wasn't known in America. Go into the details of Flanders, Royal England, and Leiden. Now, some of you will know in the 1899 um, genealogy, there was a claim that the Delanois had descended from royalty. The lords of Torquat were also called Delanois. Now, that's been around for more than 100 years. It's taken until I've come along with my both expertise and found the evidence to lay that to rest. And there's a lot of actually unreliable information, possibly more than any other thing. Now, I say 500 footnotes that's steeped in evidence that's so crucial, not just the evidence of documents, but I've consulted a lot of 
books and all the rest of it. And I've talked to a lot of people, local experts who've helped a heck of a lot, could not possibly have done this on my own. Now, fairly heavy weather, some of these scholarly things. So what I've done, I've also written a book with Delano and Cook Ancestors, same title as this. Now, it's an 8,000 word story. I've probably got over 30,000 words in the articles I've written. What I wanted to do was do a, a book that brought to life that every Delano and Cook would want to read and would be able to understand. So much shorter, it's cut out a lot of the complex arguments, has maps and other things and so on, designed to bring the story to life for you, which I hope I've done. So thanks very much for listening. Um, Jeff mentioned that I have my own family history service. So if you're interested in having your ancestors from Britain or what have you researched, then please feel free to get in touch with research your people. But thank you very much for listening. Presentation. Um, you know, George uh, just mentioned he does he does do this. You know, he uh, I gave him a, a name of one of my ancestors and he got back to me in no time at all. Apparently the prison records in Europe are, are quite, uh, quite con uh, conclusive. Um, but George, um, I, I'm, I'm almost speechless with the presentation. I mean, it was, it was wonderful. You know, usually when we hear about genealogy, we see it all presented as a family tree and you know, this one married this one and this one that, but the, the fact that you're bringing in, you know, the, the, uh, the rulers of these countries, you're bringing in these maps, you're bringing in, uh, you know, all this, this history that really shaped the movement and, and uh, you know, and the direction that the family went in. Um, it's, just, it's just fabulous. But uh, let's go back to the beginning. How did you get started in all of this? Yeah, <laughs> actually, it was at my mother's funeral in 2003 when someone brought along a British delegate, <clears throat> someone came to Britain in 785, a British delegate family tree. And I got interested, and they told me about relatives who had actually researched them. Quite a lot of research they'd gone across to Leiden and France. And in fact, a great aunt had found in the 1960s that the Delanois first went to England. You know, a very important aspect to this. Um, and then later that year, someone mentioned there's a, a Delano Society in America, the Delano Kindred. And I joined them then and which is the rest of history, but that's the start. <laughs> so it's, that's amazing. It all started there. Now, when you're doing this, and obviously you've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours, uh, you know, researching and looking over things and talking with people and going over what other people have done and everything. What what are the challenges or difficulties do you do you encounter when you when you set about this work? I mean, it's it seems monumental. How do you how do you push through all that? Yeah, I, I mean, it's been, in a sense, it's like anyone started with things, and of course, we've got the Delano Kindred Society, which was started in 1991, and the Pilbara and Francis Cook Society 2003, and they'll have done the thing. How do we, a mission is, if you like, is to find out what happened afterwards and before. Um, and of course, it'd be great with Muriel Cushing for, for Delano's. There's seven generations in the Philip Delano Green Book. Uh, Ralph Banks has done the same thing for um, Francis Cook. Now, they've done much less before 1621. Two big reasons. One is it's difficult, and second, it's expensive. And we're talking about a number of countries. We're talking about France, it's France. Belgium, England, and Holland. There's the flights and the travel and accommodation. Uh, the Delano Kindred in the past had budgets of up to two and a half thousand dollars a year. Languages, we're talking about not just English, but French, Dutch, and even Spanish. And then old records. There are less old records. But even when you find one, you've got to read that old handwriting. And there are examples where people have found a record, but then stumble over reading the words. <clears throat> so I came to this, I wasn't a genealogist then. My background, I've always been quite an analytical thinking and I bought things from the past, uh, working with people, problem solving. Um, and in 2011, I went and studied as a genealogist and qualified, of course, that's my abilities by leaps and bounds. And as I say, I set up my own family history service, which has carried on developing. What particularly I've learned from there is this bringing to life, which I think your comments there, hopefully that's part of what I did today. So the start point with the Delanos was this 1899 Delano genealogy. You know, a lot of good stuff that have been to development since. But in fact, a lot of errors as well. So quite a lot of what was needed was I would get an article, but I had a clue whether it was right or wrong because there were no um, sources and all the rest of it. So quite a lot of correcting and updating to be done. Um, and one of the keys here, I went and I looked at things, but the people were so important. I build relationships. So Philippe Ramer was the president of the genealogy group of the North. 
first round of coffee, he spent the morning with me. I've got something like 50 pages of emails and things from Philippe. Jose Barbier is the um, curator of the talk around local history. So went across, met him. He took me on a tour. He took me to that first floor in St. Christopher's and showed me where those registers were hid. So you find like-minded people and then you just sort of connect and begin to uh, to build from there. Now, historians, you know, when, when historians put together history, um, you know, they look just as you do for the evidence. They look for the, you know, the documents, the facts, the pieces of the puzzle. But very often what happens is the, um, the, the, the information they find has got gaps. You know, and so the information they find really becomes more of stepping stones. And historians have a certain, you know, poetic license to be able to build that connective tissue between one fact or one piece of evidence and the next and sort of suppose, okay, well, here's what we think happened and that will make this this uh, connection, uh, you know, seem to make sense. Uh, do do uh, Genealogists have that. I mean, how, how does it work in, in genealogy? I know it's it's quite uh, accepted in in uh, in history, but how does it how does it work? And, and what comes into your mind as you're you're creating that connective tissue between the, the stepping stones? Yeah, I, I'm absolutely key. I mean, it's geniality and history and social together. I talk about bringing to life. You know, geniality will tell you. You know, he was born there in 1575 doesn't tell you any more. And, and particularly if so far ago, there's a lot of gaps. Of course there are. What you must do, though, is speculation is a perfectly valid thing to do. I wonder if this happened. Because then you can start to look at it and you can start to find reason and information and so on. But you must have a plausible reason. Fair is one of the big debates is, was Philippe de Landra on the speed well? Now, the 1899 Delano Geniality said, it's presumed that he was. Lee Land and Bangs in 1984 said that he was among a group on the speed well. Uh, recently, there's been uh, um, a thing that a belief that in it can be a belief that he was. <clears throat> but I've been through all the articles. I've not found a single even plausible reason behind it. Now, it can be. I got in touch with the, the archives there, and Cressida Williams. She got someone to look at this for this. So basically, I've not found a shred of evidence or reason that he was or wasn't. We don't know, but you must come forth with a plausible reason because then you can work on that. And a lot of things we never will know, but we can be more informed. That's inter interesting you should say that. We have a uh, portrait of uh, Sarah Roosevelt uh, in President Roosevelt's study in the, in the library. And there's two stories about how it got there. And we're not really sure which is, which is you know, the story, although we know the picture is there. One is that when she got wind of the fact that he was going to have uh, a, an office here in the library building, um, she was put off by that. And she wanted to have you know, him stay in the little office that he had in the house. And so, uh, you know, one story is that she gave him this portrait, this, you know, two by three foot portrait of her um, so that she, he wouldn't forget her when he was over there in the office. Um, the other is that uh, she gave it to him uh, in spite, which was uh, to say, OK, you want to have an office over there, Mr. You know, Mr. Uh, you know, smarty pants. Well, then guess what? You know, you're going to have in this office, you're going to have a portrait of me and I'm going to keep an eye, you know, over you. And what I find fascinating about that is that both of those stories, knowing Sarah and her personality um, are perfectly legitimate stories, uh, but we don't really know where the truth is. And uh, the truth is, or the fact is that the portrait is there for whatever, uh, whatever reason. So I, I, I totally get what you're saying um, with that. Now, you know, one of the things I really loved about your, your presentation, George, is uh, is that you, you constantly talk to us as the audience of here's where your relatives worshipped. Here's where your ancestors stood. Here's the streets. Here's the houses that your ancestors uh, were at. And that really drives it home. It really brings it home to the fact that, you know, you're, you're pulling us into the story and you're putting us right there uh, where these folks were. And the other thing I think is really, really strong, and I'd like you maybe just talk a little bit about that, is the use of the maps. I mean, I, I, I've seen, you know, again, the family trees, but the use of the maps. Tell us more about that. How did you, how did you come about doing that? <laughs> yeah. In fact, we should ask the audience if, if it's worked. But I, I like this expression, a picture paints a thousand words. Maps are more important. You, you say that first map I did, mm -hmm. basically I used a map to cover 130 years of history key events where they happened, key people and the movements and so on. And I hope that two minutes or so 
gave people an understanding that they've not had before, so they built on it. And then that one about the, where they were in Flanders, where France and the Huguenots were, and Wallonia and the Walloons. I mean, that confusion has gone on for more than 100 years. You know, that map hopefully would just, like, I commission those maps especially in order to get that message across. That's great. So I'm going to, we've got some questions coming in from the folks that have been watching. Um, quite a few Delano's from around uh, around uh, the globe here. We've got folks from Chile. We've got folks from London. We've got folks from Maine, all across the United States. Can I just come and, in quickly? The, the, yes. the branch of Britain, there's a the branch in Chile. A guy in Chile had 26 children by four different wives. So there's over 4,000 Delano's down in Chile. <laughs> Wow. Well, we've got one of them watching uh, with us today. So uh, where can folks get your book, George? Uh, there's some folks that are, uh, well, two things. Now, one, uh, one thing is um, folks are responding to this very well, but there's so much information and it's gone by so quickly. Um, is, is, are you able to make your PowerPoint available uh, to, to folks? In principle, yeah. The book, the book is ready for publication. Now, I've looked into self-publication and I can probably make more money doing that. But I think this is important enough to be published by a Mayflower or similar organization. So I'd say out there, if anyone's got any information about that sort of publication thing, please get in touch because, you know, I believe it's an important story. If others do, then, you know, I think it should be on that sort of platform. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. We've, got here, we've got the real detail in the Mayflower Descender articles. We've got the book, which does stuff. And then we've got a presentation like this, which is a great way of putting across some of the key things. Absolutely. Now, remind us, what country was uh, Rue de Franklin Roosevelt located in? Sorry, which? Uh, one of our, our viewers is asking, uh, may I please ask what country Rue de, Ro Rue de Franklin Roosevelt was located in? So I think they're talking about this the street that you had mentioned. Oh, sorry, Torquin. So T-O-U-R, like Tor, C-O-N-G, it's near Lille. And so where would that be? After the Second World War, well, they built it to say thank you for what Roosevelt did in the Second World War. Um, but, and it's on the northeast side. You'll find it soon enough if you get there. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, and did you say that the, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, M-A-H-I-E-U-S were not Huguenots? Mahia, no. <clears throat> the people from Flanders. The, 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 so there's Lille. Torquay is quite near Lille. That's where the Delanois lived. The Mahiers lived in, we know, in four places. They lived in Lille and three places. So they were all from Flanders. They were not from France, which is where the Huguenots were from. Eventually, you know, blanket terms, you know, like my thing about USA and Canada, you know, they're all Americans. Right. So for one word, blanket term for refugees, they tend to say Huguenots. But it's very important to know that ours were not. They were, but they were so do you ever come across, George, you know, you know, you're looking at all this information, you're looking at all this documentation, do you ever come across a ship's log, a, a, a church record, a, a deed to property or something like that, that just totally disproves something that, that folks have been thinking, um, you know, and just totally uproots that, that particular part of the story? And, and, and if you do do that, how does that, how do you bring that forth and how does that play into the overarching picture? Yeah, absolutely. In a way, I talk about these 45 publications. In a sense, that was going on all the time. I had this information, I wasn't sure, and all the rest of it. Um, and in fact, I mentioned this thing about the registers being hidden in um, the church. I mean, a remarkable story. So 1578, the soldiers go into the church, and obviously they hid the registers, the baptism and other registers, under the floor, on the first floor. They weren't discovered until 1897 more than 300 years before. Now, luck plays a part. Mortimer Delano, who wrote the Delano Genealogy, had been there literally two years beforehand. He wow. missed finding that register with the entry for uh, Jean de Lanois by two years. Wow. I went there and I missed it. Why? Because it had been wrongly labeled. It had been labeled from 1590 onwards, wow. 1575. Now, Jeremy Bangs was the one who finally found it. I'd love to ask him if he knew about that or whether it was just a happy accident. But he found it. But I'm talking about struggling to read old writing. He struggled to read the words. And the word Verdica, the district where they were from, he didn't get right. Um, so gradually, I mean, what a story, you know, hidden for 300, was it Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation was hidden for, what, 80 years? 
for over 300 years. So these sort of things are going on. And like the, the maps and the places, I can go and get factual stuff there. The speed, well, we don't know. But what I try to do very much is to take issues and try and find information. So at least there's a balance of pros and cons and it can be a more informed decision. Um, now, this was you said this was mislabeled. Did, was this something that they knew was out there and they just didn't know where it was? Or was it just something when they discovered it, it was like, wow, we didn't even know this existed? I mean, you say it was missing for 300 years. I'm, I'm honestly not sure. I mean, baptism registers only started around there. Um, uh -huh. I suspect they didn't know, but they found it. Um, but also, what's it, I said I missed it by about three years. Jose Barbier, I went the year before it was discovered, and Jose took me up to that first floor, show me where those registers were. But neither of us twigged that those registers had the entry of Jean de Lanois in. So, wow. you know, sometimes luck plays a part. Was it Gary Player playing golf hold and said, more I practice, the luckier I get. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Now, clearly the, the most famous Delano in America was hands down uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Delano. And she's often portrayed in the in the Roosevelt family, um, you know, uh, story as, as kind of being a, a little bit of a stick in the mud, a little bit grumpy, maybe a little cranky. Um, and what you had said when you first started this idea of the Delano's being tough and rugged and intrepid really, um, you know, gives uh, some insight to that. So it's, it seems to be like a family trait that these guys were just very serious and very, you know, all, all business. And, um, you know, tell us a little bit more about how they, they, they moved around. I mean, you know, most people would have just, I think, moved, put up with whatever they were putting up with or, you know, but, but to move, I think you said four countries in 50 years. That's incredible. Can you tell us more about that? A couple of things, I said, I worked a lot with people. I did personality analysis and so on. It's very interesting. Um, there's different personality types, lots of personality traits. And very often you would they describe it in a positive way and a negative. So some could be determined or they could be stubborn. <laughs> Very often you get one personality type talk about another. So someone at work might be sociable. Somebody else might say they're a time waster. <laughs> and you make the description of Sarah. Now, um, so that's obviously subjective comments. Well, could the same be said that there was someone who was serious, was sensitive, strong-willed, and... The Delanois and Machias in Europe, we don't know, but you'd have to be pretty tough to cope with that and rugged. And the word resilient goes from the mind a lot and intrepid. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And it's interesting. I think we're, we're, we're types, personality types, it depends on situation and so on. I say very often, I mean, these days, unfortunately, you get someone puts one fact out there and uh, I have a mantra, be informed, objective and balanced. Absolutely, absolutely. Now we've got uh, someone uh, writing a question in uh, or a statement in from uh, from Vermont, and they uh, are of the Delano line, and they say they pronounce it Delano. <laughs> yeah, I'm told it's pronounced in different ways in different times. <laughs> okay. Basically. There's a George Delano who was the president, and I did a talk in March about Mayflower. I handed that question over to him. <laughs> That's interesting because we have the same problem with Roosevelt. Some people pronounce it Roosevelt. Some people pronounce it Roosevelt. And uh, I've always been told that the Oyster Bay, the Teddy Roosevelt part of the family, pronounces it Roosevelt. And the uh, Hudson Valley Roosevelts, FDR, uh, pronounces it um, uh, as, as Roosevelt. So what is the key takeaway from this, George? I mean, you, 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 you've walked us through hundreds of years of history and you know, travels across countries, but what would you say is, is the, the, the key takeaway from this from this research in, in broad strokes? Yeah, I mean, to me, the most important thing is if Delano and Cook descendants of Roosevelt can now visualize their ancestors more, can, can visualize where they live, want to go there and so on and so forth. We talk about characteristics. I mean, I, I say, quite to do a survey, wouldn't it, of Delano's and Cook's and see what if there are some common characteristics uh, like stubbornness or what have you. But that to me is the most important thing. But it's backed by fact. It's backed by evidence now where we can find it. Whereas we've literally had more than 100 years where different things are said and all the rest of it. You know, talking about Waluna and all the rest of it. So it's a speed well. But let's have some fact. We've now got a firm base that we can build on. People can read. The may have a very full, but hopefully the book is much more accessible. Um, but uh, if like we can go forward together. <laughs> That's great. Can you can you talk a little bit more about, you know, you keep mentioning the Mayflower and the Mayflower, um, you know, uh, log and such. Can you tell us more about the Mayflower separ separationists? What, what, what was separatists? 
Um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's enough. The Mayflower, you know, I talk about it, and it wasn't just an English thing. There were no Irish, Scots, or Welsh on the Mayflower. And it wasn't even England. It was the middle of England, these two congregations who were the court, other than the cross in due course. But uh, the passengers that they found where they came from, they're all in the middle or south of England. But they go across to Leiden. John Robinson was a very key player, and there's a lot of people out there, I'm sure, who know more than I did. But they eventually separate from the Church of England and go there. I find it interesting. John Robinson in 1620, he stayed in Leiden. And he died there five years later. Uh, their lives out there, they were tough, they got jobs, but they were poorly paid. And, um, you know, I'd love to have been able to talk to William Bradford and people about how they felt, what, what, what they thought. You know, actually, when they went across to uh, America, that they left in the end of July, they had problems with the speedboat. They actually left in the middle of September from Plymouth to go to a country where they had no housing, no crops planted. They were almost exactly six months wrong. I don't know if they went, oh, we can't go this year, let's go next year. No, we've got to go. But you know, they arrived in mid-November. Gosh, that must have been tough as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It may be tough now with all the modern conveniences and such. Um, what advice would you give to um, to, the, to any budding uh, genealogist who, who might be um, who might be watching? You know, uh, you, you've obviously spent a great deal of time and learned a great set of skills in, in doing this. So what, what advice would you give to the to the budding genealogists out there who might be you know, either interested in Delano stuff or maybe even in their own, you know, different family branch? Yeah, I think, I mean, evidence has to be the most important thing. Both find evidence when someone passes you information, ask, what is the evidence for that? Say so very strongly, keep an open mind. I have discussions with people who say it was this way or that way, etc. So be open to the fact that it can be, be different. Um, now, <clears throat> the Delano Kindred, used to have a European research group who well, finally they revived it. And I'd say to them as well, you know, make sure you find out what's been done before, what's been looked at before. And if you're going to look at another bunch of records, then have an informed reason for doing so, because you can waste an awful lot of time and money. Uh, I, I've been five trips to Europe and so on at expense and so on. So, so I know. <laughs> Well, that's great. That's great. That's that's wonderful because that's one of the first things I know our archivists ask people when they come looking for information on the Roosevelts. You know, one of the first questions you ask is, you know, what have you looked at? You know, um, if you haven't looked at anything uh, in the past, what other folks have said, what other folks have, have you know, uh, postulated about and put forth, um, you know, you, you really need to look to, to do that so that you can get a sense of what's been charted, what hasn't been charted, what's been proven, what hasn't been proven, and it'll really help to uh, to keep you from going down some some stray avenues and such. And I also love what you just said about keeping the open mind. You know, I, I taught for 12 years before I got this job and um, I would assign research papers and students would come in and then say, yo, you know, Mr. Urban, I've been, I've been researching this for three months and, you know, none of this, none of these things I'm, I'm learning are backing up what my, my thesis is, you know, and, um, you know, it, it never occurs to them that maybe your thesis is wrong. You know, if the evidence is all pointing in that direction, you know, you, you can't fall in love with, with your hypothesis or with your thesis. You need to be able to let the information take you where it will take you and, and, you know, follow through with those, uh, with those, uh, those, uh, those avenues, those facts, those, those things, you know, George, we, we've got quite a few people here who are, are, are uh, now saying they're going to have to take a trip back to the old country to, uh, to, to walk down those streets, to stand in those, places, to go to those, those churches. And, and I'm assuming you'll all, you'll, you'll allow them all to stay at your place while they're over there. Is well, I've got a poll who actually the Delano Kindred are talking seriously in 2023 about doing such a trip. And in fact, I've got a cousin, William English, who, who lives very close to Canterbury. And um, so in principle, yeah, we're, 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 come on over. That's wonderful. That's great. So what's what's next for you, George? I mean, uh, what what is the next, uh, you know, you, you've followed this all through pretty well. Um, I know you're going to continue to write, but what, what's your next uh, genealogical gem that you're going to be going after? Yeah, well, I think from this point of view, um, I look on this as like a new chapter. We can put the you know, the unreliable uh, claims on behind us. We've got a firm base now. I hope your yes, descendants really get turned on by their family and what they can do. Scholars, you know, people can build on this and take, but there's a firm base to work on. And I put a 20 part strategy to the Delano Kindred for what I think is that quite a lot of what needs to happen is correcting and updating what we've got now. Um, publication, websites, internet. Plymouth Patuxet have got wrong things about their information to get out there. 
my researches. You know, I'm very happy to hand those over and share those with people if we can come to a reasonable agreement. The part one of the Delano genealogy, you know, most of it's about this royal claim. I'd like to rewrite it so it's got the bits that are true, you know, so people can really get across. And I'm a great believer in teamwork. You know, I'm one person in this. Delighted to work with anyone else that um, shares their own objectives. You know, it's interesting you should say that, you know, setting the record straight, getting the evidence uh, out there, uh, you know, accepting it as such and then moving forward um, is, is quite interesting. And I, and I bet there's probably a lot of pushback on that, um, you know, either people who, who uh, you know, don't want to accept the fact or um you know they've just been they've been told so many times before or some of it's up to interpretation but i i i can i can sympathize with what you're up against because fdr always said that uh, you should never let the facts get in the way of a good story um and uh you know he was always one to uh sort of bend and stretch uh you know some of the story parts um you know, to, to make it, I'm not saying that he was in, in, inaccurate or, you know, told lies or things, but he liked to tell a good yarn and, uh, and the Delano's, uh, you know, certainly um, have got a lot of, of material there to mine to, um, you know, to tell these, these yarns and, uh, and these, uh, these stories. Um, so you say there's, you, there, there, you're, there's a trip in next year, did you say, planned for this? Talk about 1623. I mean, it's very early days, but um, right. it's for you. You know, I, I mean, I mean the, the, you know, Paul Sparrow was talking about a Roosevelt trip as well, that it may be there's a combination or whatever. But uh, That would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. You know, that's, again, I, I really appreciate your, your the, the, the words of putting us, you know, here's where your, your ancestors worshipped or here's where they stood, because that's one of the things that's so important to us here at the library, you know. Um, you know, to come here and stand where Roosevelt stood, um, to be in his home, to be at his library, to look at the river that he loved so much, you know, to really get there is 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 such an authentic experience, and it brings the documents, the maps, the you know, the information. It brings that all to life, and that's really the most I think exciting thing about uh, about all of this. Yeah, I was in Hyde Park in 2013, and I totally agree. That's great. You got to come back, George. Next time you come back, we'll uh, they built a brew pub across the street. We'll take you across, and we'll. We'll, we'll get some some more stories out of you, Jeff. You're all hearts. It's great. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> this has been this has been absolutely amazing, George. And I, we wish you all the best luck uh, in the continuation of your of your research and your genealogy hunt and such. And thank you so much for sharing this with us. For um, you know, uh, lifting up the corners of history and letting us look underneath here and and find out um, so much more about the Delano family. You know, we hear so much about the Roosevelts, um, but much of of what Franklin was and who Franklin uh, you know was uh, was shaped by that that Delano spirit and that that Delano ancestry. So you've really um, shed some some wonderful light on this, and we and I want to thank you so much. We're getting wonderful comments in the comments about it as as well. Well, Jeff, thanks very much. It's been a real pleasure. Absolutely. Come back and talk to us again sometime, George, will you? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely great. Thank you, George, and thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you again here uh, at Home with the Roosevelts. Thank you. Bye-bye.